Hi, welcome back to Making Action Happen. I'm Sarah Blackhurst. And I'm Brian McCain. And we have a really special guest today. She's our new board member to Action 22, but she also oversees 211, which we're going to talk all about. And she works for SRDA. Yvonne Garcia joined Action 22 team um, probably a month ago, and we're really excited to have her on because she's bringing a lot of the very needed voice um, to the to the board that we hadn't had before. But before that, I want to just give a shout out on Memorial Day yesterday, we had, uh, of course, we were back down at, at Pueblo at the Home of Heroes at the Veterans Bridge. It's always such a great ceremony. Chris Anderson, and I called her by a different name. I called her Chris Martinez earlier, but Chris Anderson, um, she's the head of the Pueblo Veterans Council, and she put that together. She always puts together a great um, a great lineup for that. And, of course, our DA, Jeff Chosner, who always serves veterans in our community, was the MC again. Uh, and Paul... Hendrickson spoke and there was some really it was pretty poignant and emotional I I was wiping tears more than once yesterday and it was a beautiful day except for the wind and but the plane still flew over the plane they still said they flew weren't over going to. they said it was too windy but they made it they, so they DOS, did DOS they, aviation um, whatever they're called now but DOS aviation they did their flyby which they've been doing it since they've been in Pueblo. It's such a great event, and that's the one you spoke at last year, but you took a day off because it was your birthday, Yes, and so we let you um, skate on that one this year, but it was... I did you, show no, up, you did. I did. You were go. there. You were there, but we didn't. We did. They didn't make you speak this year, which was which was really nice. But it was it was really great. The theme sort of this year was all about um, also remembering the families because we talk so much about veterans, but no, none of them can do that without the without the families and on um, their support and kind of what they go through. And so it was it was a. There's always a little bit of a theme every year, and the theme was about families, and um, it was it was really really good. Now there was a tense moment, yes. so um, Jeff Chosner and we had kind of talked about this offline, uh, and it was noticed last year as well. So when it's not an election year, there aren't very many people you know that always show up. I mean, it's always the same people that show up. Of course, both college presidents show up, both uh, PCC and CSUP show up. Um and then you have all of your veteran organizations in Pueblo. Um and and a lot of times and it used to be the case that any of the um federal um or the congressional delegation, their representatives would show up if they weren't showing up. Um, or just elected officials in general. Elected officials in general, and uh, it was toward the end. And um, the and um, Jeff Chosner said, "And I, I'm so sorry, I forgot to uh, recognize the dignitaries. Uh, would any of the elected officials who are here, would you please stand up?" And nobody stood. The only elected official there yesterday was Jeff Chosner because he's the attorney or he's the district attorney here um, for Pueblo. Um, and I, I just, mm. but, and Jeff has been doing this before he was the district attorney. Oh, this, he's always this done this. And he never says that he's like, you know, the DA or no, like he just, he does it. He just does it. And yeah. he, and it, it's because of his genuine affection for the veteran community. And he has done a ton for the vet, the veteran community here, veterans court, but just everything he does, he doesn't ever miss, um, a funeral or somebody sick or anything like that. Um, and in fact, the very first time I met Jeff, um, was, uh, we were, I was emceeing a Memorial day event and he was one of the speakers. So, um, it's always really important to him. Um, and he read the last two, um, the last two verses of, um, America the Beautiful, and again, you know, I was I was in tears. It was really beautiful, but I have to say, it was it was really disappointing when he got ready to introduce elected officials and nobody stood up. I think that in the home of heroes, I can't let that one go without saying something. So, um, but you know, he turned it around and he said, "Look, the people who are here are the ones that are dedicated, and we know who." who they are. So, um, and it was, it was beautiful and it's, um, I hope next year we're, and we'll do a better job of publicizing it, but everybody needs to show up. Yeah. Everybody needs to show up for that. So I was really excited when you 
started to talk to me about Yvonne and who's yeah. our new board member. Yeah. Um, and some of the stuff that she's doing. This is so I have to tell you that in like how it always goes, Action Twenty Two, we say there's something that we need. And um, we don't know how it's going to happen, but um, it it happens. And it was uh, we were thinking of putting together a resource guide, and you said, "Don't you don't need to do it. It's already been done. It's funded. Mm-hmm. Let's let's do this." So so um, this was kind. Of, this was a great find on your part, Brian. Yeah, and um, part of it was uh, Steve Naraki. Uh, he's the CEO of the SRDA, correct? Yes. Um, he called me and, you know, it was time to renew the membership. And he's like, you know, we really want to be involved. So we're going to, if we're going to renew it, we want to be involved. I'm like, absolutely. We have some spots on our board. So I went and met and I, I did mention like, we're trying to put together a resource guide for all this. And you guys were like, <laughs> no, we already have it. Hold on. Mm-hmm. It's Colorado 211. And I'm like, I have no idea what that is. And I should, and a lot of us should, but that's when I met you and, and um, we, brought you on board, on the board. And our board was very excited because they they didn't even really know what 211 is. And also on our board, something that was not really lacking because we do have a lot of um, medical type groups or organizations that are part of the board. But specifically with the SRDA, you know, that representation in rural Colorado, it's so important after COVID, during COVID, that we saw this huge impact on our elderly population in these areas. And we were talking about that too. So it just kind of the fates aligned and now you're here with us. So why don't you introduce yourself, Yvonne? Yes. So I'm Yvonne Garcia. I'm a social worker and I'm very happy to be here. Um, I think it's very powerful to have a social worker at the table um, to help address, you know, some of the most basic needs, especially since COVID has hit. Um, And one of the things we're doing at SRDA is, uh, focusing more on the behavioral health piece um, as well. So we just were recently awarded a grant from Health Colorado, the regional accountable entity here in in Pueblo and surrounding region. Um, They awarded us so that we could do some support groups. So we have the capacity to do uh, hybrid, virtual, and in-person to neighboring counties as well. And that is for older folks who are 50 and over that want a place to network um, socialize, talk about, you know, everything that's happened since COVID's hit, um, kind of how we've been coping, things like that. And so I'm very proud and excited to be able to offer that. We actually have our, our group starting June 7th. Um, so it's no cost to anybody, um, that's wanting to join that. Um, and like I said, people can attend virtually if they can't drive over here from, from surrounding counties. Um, so that's something we're really focusing is behavioral health. Um, as far as the two on one piece, we're very excited to get the word out, and I think Action Twenty Two is a great platform to help get the word out as well. Um, we at SRDA serve um, two on one callers and inquiries for two on one assistance from. And I hate to interrupt you, but let's back up for just a second. Yeah. So um, I don't know if all of our listeners are going to know who and what SRDA is. So will you will you tell us who that oh, is? Oh, sure. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so SRDA is the Senior Resource Development Agency, really long name. So we call it SRDA. It's our local senior center here in Pueblo. So uh, we serve folks um, with different programming, um, home delivered meals, in-home um, assistance, um, companionship care, things like that, recreation opportunities. We have um, exercise equipment free to use um, in the building, just a bunch of uh, programs and services to enrich the lives of older adults in in our community. And you don't just serve in public county, correct? Correct, yes. Uh, We serve um, surrounding southeast. Um, So we have Baca, Bent, Custer, Crowley, Fremont, Huerfano, Kiowa, Los Animas, Otero, Prowers, and of course Pueblo. So about half of the Action Twenty Two footprint is served mm-hmm. um, by by SRD. Okay, go ahead. So two one one. Sorry. So for two one one, it's surprising how many folks don't know about two one one, but um, you can kind of compare it to four one one. So you call four one one and ask for the number to Pizza Hut or whatever. Um, so two one one is Health and Human Services focused. So you can call and ask a two one one resource specialist. Um, 
about where the nearest food pantry is or, you know, you're having a hard time paying your mortgage this month or your rent this month, what agencies in your community are able to help with that? Um, so we get you connected to the right resources versus you spinning your wheels, researching all that on your own. We have a pretty large um, online database um, that houses all the different services and resources that um, – that the community can access. And so there's also a big child care referral hotline through 211. So if anyone's looking for child care services, um, places that accept the child care stipend, things like that, where you're able to call 211 and get the help that you need. So it's, uh, it's not like 911. It's not an immediate emergency. It's, it's getting to that point where are the resources? Where can I get help? Correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So we don't actually have funding to give to individuals um, specifically. It's it's more of giving you the the information that you need, um, getting you the phone numbers of the right places to call. You know, call and ask for so and so at this agency, and she might be able to help you if their current funding allows. Things like that, so that people know what they're getting into when they call. We're able to screen them to make sure they actually will qualify for those services before they call instead of calling and getting, you know, the door slammed on their face and then saying, oh, well, that was pointless. They give up, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It's it's easy to do that because it's overwhelming. Right. Yeah, and it it's frustrates me when you have, like, say, the VA or Social Security, when you have mostly the elderly population or people that are in a really bad spot, and it's like, well, go online and do this, and half the people can't even go online to do it. So it's it's – really good that there's an actual phone number they can call. Because one of the biggest complaints of people that were in that situation looking for help, they just had a phone and that was it. And you, right. and it's tough to just call somebody to get help these days. And that's why I think this is so important for that population in southeastern Colorado. Absolutely. Yeah. So how many resources um, are we talking about? Like four or five different places that you can have people call or... Uh, so depending on the need, sometimes there's more than others. So like right now for rent and mortgage assistance, specifically in Pueblo County, there's a huge need for more funding for that. So really the only agency that is currently um, providing that locally is uh, Catholic Charities. And oftentimes they are out of funding. Um, through COVID, there has been some other resources that have popped up for housing support. So that's been hopeful. Um, but as we get away from COVID, that's dwindled down a little. So we're also a big pulse for the communities. Um, a lot of times we're called upon to give data of, um, I know that we can't provide a resource for somebody because there is no resource. Um, but we're able to get the um, demographics of what unmet needs are in the community so that maybe funding can open up. Um, they can make a case for more uh, allocation to different programs that are needed. So we do provide um monthly uh, unmet needs reports to the um, DHS here locally in Pueblo County. So they're able to use that to inform what uh, their clientele may need. So off the top of your head, give me an example. So the biggest unmet need um, in Pueblo County, I would say, would be housing and utilities, um, but also uh, transportation. Uh, You'd be surprised how many folks do not have the right um, transportation for the things that they need. Um, So it's not as easy as getting on the bus. Sometimes it's medical appointments to specialists in in Colorado Springs and so forth. So just getting creative on um, directing folks on how to get the transportation they need, even though there's not a specific program for that. So um, we direct them a lot to the busting services, Colorado Busting, which SRDA also runs routes from that. but just uh, getting them a game plan, an action plan, is where to start, where to go. Um, and even if we can't help them find a, a service that fits their needs specifically, we get creative and say, well, where else in your budget can we help you maybe make ends meet so that you're able to pay for this other thing that um, is not able to locate a service mm-hmm. for. So uh, we do get creative, helping people troubleshoot um, helping them know the right things to tell agencies once they call, you know, instead of versus cold calling the right terminology of the right programmings that they're looking for, things like that. So, you know, I, I think it gets uh, overwhelming sometimes for the people like you who are doing this work. So tell me a story that you were like, this is why I keep doing this. Mm, on gosh. the two on one side. Well, I have a fun one that comes right to the top of my mind. So uh, we had a caller who said, um, I don't know anything about the online world, social media, and my dog got out 
and I'm freaking out. I, I can't find him and I need help. So one of our 211 specialists offered to um, post on his behalf on this Facebook page called uh, Pueblo Lost and Found Pets. Yep. And she was able to help her, um, the caller, find her dog. <laughs> so they reconnected him and she helped them meet, find a place to meet. And um, it was it was amazing. Yeah, they even got to take a picture. Our 201 specialist took a picture with the dog when they got to, uh, together. But a more, uh, I think on a more serious note, there was one instance where this um, woman called and she had been in a domestic violence incident and she needed help to go out of state to get away from her um, abuser. And so we, uh, why WCA was booked, they were not able to let her stay there. Um we uh, could not get like the police department involved because there wasn't an active case. So of course the victim advocates couldn't help like the DA's advocates, the COVID advocates. So we got created. We called the Pueblo rape crisis services. We called um, the YWCA and made some phone calls and advocated on her behalf, actually got her um, transportation to go out of state. Um, and she emailed us when she got there and she said, thank you so much. I got here safely and I was able to get away from the person I needed to get away from. So oh, that's that was amazing. a very powerful, yeah, yeah that's yeah. amazing. That's something you don't think about because people don't think about two one one. So, um, and, and another thing with two one one, it's anonymous, correct? Absolutely. Confidential. Yeah. Yes. Good. Good. Cause that, that seems to be a fear of people mm-hmm. these days more so than in the past. So that's yeah. important. Protecting people's privacy is so important. It's so important. Um, okay, so tell us about some of the great things. So this is just a component. Let me back up really quick. So um, where does the funding for two one one come from? Like, how does that how does that get paid for? So that's a great question because prior to COVID. Um, I know COVID was such a horrible thing, but it opened up an opportunity for us to um, have 211 get some serious funding. Um, a lot of it was temporary funding. So um, the R201 Collaborative, the head of R201 Collaborative is in Denver, and she was able to um, make some connections with the governor, and we were able to get temporary funding throughout COVID to actually help people, um, kind of like Brian said, um, go online and schedule your vaccine appointment for your mm-hmm. COVID vaccine or for your testing. Well, these folks, especially older folks or disabled folks, they can't go online. They don't know how. They don't have the access. So um, we got funding to actually, on the phone, when they call 211, schedule their appointment for them. Where do you want to go get your vaccine? Walgreens? Okay, great. We're going to go online, get you an appointment, confirm it's been scheduled. Um, you just show up. So things like that. Um, it was really powerful throughout COVID to be able to help be a part of that response. Um now that COVID, we're getting away from COVID, um, we just got uh, approval for House Bill 22-1315 um, for $1 million annually. And that goes to the whole collaborative of 211s in the state. Um, so we have partner um, 211 call centers throughout um, Colorado that will get a, po- a piece of that pot of money. Um, but we will as well, too. So we're very excited um, because this is the first time in a long time that 211 has been seriously funded and backed. Before this, um, our CEO, Steve Naraki, was so passionate about 211 that we actually um, just kind of supported the program on our own. SRDA um, did. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, it wasn't something that was grant funded or anything like that. We actually just supported it because we thought it was so important. Um, so now seeing the progress we've made, I've been with 201 for over eight years. Um, throughout that time, is just amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to show everybody how easy this is. Hold on one second. Yeah. <laughs> so... So all these great resources, all you have to do is open your phone, and I'm going to put it on speaker so you can hear it. It's this easy. 211. Thank you for calling 211 Colorado, the source for information on resources in the community. To continue in English, press 8. That's it. That's it. That's the whole thing. Just like that. So just press 211 and you're on your way to getting some answers that you probably, and how unexpected for somebody to call and say, I don't have social media, but I really need to find my dog. (laughs) Or I don't have an active case, but I really need to get out of the state Mm -hmm. for my safety. Um, that's, that's amazing. Um, and it's, you don't just serve, um, seniors, right? Anybody can call. You don't have to be over 65 or anything, even though SRDA is, um, 
supports this. And right. So SRD mainly serves um, older adults age uh, 50 and over, but with 211, it's for anyone to call. We've actually had high school students call and say, you know, my classmate came to school hungry and they don't have food at home. Mm. Is there a way for you to help me find a food pantry? So we're able to find, um, help them locate. So if it's a high school or a college student, whoever it is, we're able to help them. Yeah. And it also, you have a webpage for it too, correct? Yes. So those who do go online um, and enjoy, you know, self-service, you can do 211colorado.org and look up for the whole state, resources for the whole state. You're able to print off a list of resources at the end of your um, search. So if you know what you want to look for, you just um, get all the resources onto one page and it's a printable version and you start calling those numbers. Cool. So, so. For, the, for those watching this on YouTube, we'll put the link down below and I okay. also I'm going to put it on the Action 22 website as right, well right, for, our, right. for our community. So it's 211colorado.org and um, this was really important so if you if you're a caregiver and you don't know where what resources need you can literally go on to the website and sort of create your your list mm-hmm. your grocery list of I want to call these resources and it prints out a list of those those phone numbers and how to get to those for everything that you're working on. Um, that's an, another incredible piece. How long has two one one been around? Gosh, it's been. We're actually celebrating our twentieth anniversary for Colorado, but it's been around longer worldwide. There's two one one all over, all over the world. I'm so yeah. mad at myself I that I never knew about this. I would have, I would have <laughs> been using this forever. We would have <laughs> utilized this when I was at hospice. So I would have yeah. utilized. There's a ton. So. We're going to fix that. We're going to help you guys get the word out for sure. And SRDA, of course, is one of the one of the real gems of our community. Um, such a worthy nonprofit, and they're an Action Twenty Two member yes, too. Yes, yes, they are. And with that too, I think we're going to start putting together some road trips to go down into southeastern Colorado and drag you along with us to Great. meet everybody. Yeah. yeah. Well, we want everybody to meet you. Um, so, SRDA is also working on some cool new stuff. For mm-hmm. the summer. Yeah. To watch the summer. Tell us about what else SRDA is doing. So when uh, COVID first hit, we had to close our building um, to the public. We were still operating services like 211 um, in-house, just no no public walk-ins. So we're happy to announce that um, we were able in the middle of this month to op- reopen our doors to walk-in business um, and also recreation, um, in-person recreation activities. So um The only thing not yet open, quite open yet, is our um, lunch site. So on the first floor of SRDA, folks 16 over can uh, come eat a lunch meal for free and socialize. And it's by donation. So if you don't have anything to contribute, you don't have to. Um, But that's reopening shortly. We have a new um, coordinator for that program um, starting next week. So give him some time to get his um, feet on the ground and get everything uh, situated and then we will reopen that site for folks to come and eat and oh, hang that's out. such a yeah. big deal and um you do the meals on wheel our meals on wheels also correct correct yes we do meals on wheels as well for people who are not able to leave the home um but those who are again like i said they can come to srda and eat soon um there's also other community sites in those rural areas um like avondale um and beulah where uh, folks can go eat there and we take those same meals to those areas so that they can eat. So let me tell you, I um, I see the SRDA van. So right across the street, um, there must be somebody that lives over there. There's um, some cabins and stuff right across the street where I live in Rye. And the SRDA van comes two or three times a week, I think, and picks somebody up and they come back. Um, they do that for the whole region. You guys help provide some transportation for the whole region. Mm-hmm. Don't you get the SRDA vans or... Um, I say vans, they're, they're buses. Mm -hmm. Um, they're not very big, but you guys, can you talk a little bit about your transportation, what you guys SRDA does? Cause that ends up being a really big deal. And I'll tell you a funny story Okay, about, about an SRDA person that's, uh, sort of saved somebody else, but go ahead. Um, yeah. So transportation, uh, the priority for our transportation services is medical appointments, always medical appointments first. Um, if, you know, funding should run out. Um, that would be the priority. But we also transport to grocery trips so that people can get their groceries to food pantries, um, to commodities. 
out on East 4th um, so that they can get those food staples. Um, and then also to other, um, like, recreational activities. Now that SRDA is open, they can transport you to SRDA. And that's all free of charge. There is a suggested donation. When you first get on the bus, you can put it in a lockbox if you have some change or a few dollars, but you don't have to. So uh, it is free of charge for anyone 60 and over. And those rural folks, you don't even have to be 60. We can transport college kids, um, high school kids uh, of any age, folks of any age in the rural areas. That's a, that ends up being a huge thing because we talk a lot about transportation, but it's those to your door and from your door, especially in rural communities, mm-hmm. that becomes problematic. So there was a snowstorm earlier this year, and I'm a jerk and just sort of watch this whole thing unfold. So the SRDA van comes in, the guy knew what he was doing, and then um, there was a, I think it was a FedEx truck, and he comes in or something like, or either a FedEx truck, or maybe it was a propane truck or something. They come in, it was a big vehicle, and I and they looked to see, and I was like, oh, they're going to get stuck. They're going to get stuck. They're so going to get stuck. And sure enough, he gets so stuck, because mm-hmm. it was right after a snowstorm, oh. So they were and they hadn't plowed or anything. The sweet SRDA driver, whoever's up there, he mm-hmm. needs an extra medal, because he, he comes out, he gets out, and he comes and he coaches the guy and helps him get out. He didn't dig him out, but... He, basically taught him how to drive a truck in that kind of weather and the guy got out eventually but um, that SRDA guy you can always see they're just ready to help um, the people that drive those buses they do it um, you know they're, they're not getting paid a lot but they do they're so service oriented they're so great Absolutely. so you just send back a good report oh, for great. us that's yeah. good to like, hear on that yeah. what else anything else so yeah I think um You know, the other thing that I wanted to mention is we are hosting a 4th of July party at SRDA this year. This is our first ever, and it's a fundraiser, so um, there is a cost to each ticket, but all proceeds go directly to the services we provide. Um, And so what that entails is we'll be able to watch the firework display. We're right there on the Riverwalk, very close, you know, the heart of downtown. So um, we have a really beautiful sunroom that was recently renovated, um, gorgeous huge windows so we're going to have that available for viewing the fireworks display nice. from indoors folks who don't like mosquitoes and the wind and, and all that rent, yeah um and <laughs> ticket yeah and ticket prices include a barbecue um so we'll have hamburgers hot dogs refreshments and then we have a cash bar available as well so oh, that's cool um we have that and for folks who do want to view outdoors they can still come outdoors um with us um, get a ticket to sit in our party tent outdoors and same thing, barbecue refreshments, things like that. So, oh, and that's that. front row seats for the, the it fireworks is. show. It is front row seats. Yeah, for great. Be- best seats in uh, Union Avenue. Right yeah, there. absolutely. So, they are absolutely. So if somebody was interested in donating, supporting, or even, um, volunteering, where should they look? Yes. Yeah, so they can, um, they can go to our website um, and look for our deputy director, um, her email. That's the best way to get a hold of her email. Her um, she her name's Tara Morrow, and it's just tmorrow at srda.org. Um, and, yes, we are absolutely looking for volunteers. Or if you do want to become a supporter, we're doing um, – a new thing this year where we have individual sponsorships. So it'll be like a legacy sponsor. Um and so um, even if you're not with a corporation or a business, you can become an individ- individual donor. Um, so that's something we're doing this year. We'll also be doing the Chili Festival. Um, every year we sell, we do bar service at the Chili Festival um, and sell like chili popcorn and things like that. Um, so you can stop by and catch us at the Chili Festival Because that's too. also right in the middle of yes, the... Yes, it is. SRDA is really nicely yes, positioned yeah. for Absolutely. all the good stuff in Pueblo, mm-hmm. for sure. So uh, if now we know everybody's going to want to share about 211 now that they know a little bit about it. So if you want to be a part of the road trip that we're going to do, so talk about that for just a second, Brian, because there's kind of a bigger picture on this too. Yeah, so uh, big picture, um, talking to the regional director for HHS, um, she's been thinking about doing some road trips and her heart's in Colorado. She covers more places than just Colorado, but we're discussing that. But in the meantime, um, I think action 22 
being that all these things we've talked about today is what's really impacting our area and specifically in southeastern rural part of it. Mm -hmm. So Action 22 will be going on the road and bringing Vaughn to to go with us to meet county commissioners, community leaders, um, community champions, and basically just get the word out what SRDA provides, what 211 provides, and just put a face to all of it. Because as we've learned post ish COVID right now. Um, <laughs> ish. People want that connection. And what COVID showed us was that specifically in rural, like there is a connection and that impacted people hard, especially with mental well being. Um, I always forget what to say, but mental health. Yeah. Uh, um, and the mission that SRDA is doing right now is very important for those rural communities. And not just SRDA, you have the VA going out doing the same thing. You have um, HHS, which is like Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare. Um, we're seeing a huge influx of these Medicaid specialists now popping up in these areas because it's so important. And again, going back to how it was, it's like, oh yeah, to register for your healthcare benefits, just go online. A lot of people that need these the most can't go online, which is why 211 is important and why also getting out to these communities and interacting with this population is very important. And that's and, what we're going to be assisting with. An anonymous private, that's really, that piece is really, really important. So it, it doesn't matter what your age is or anything like that, that you still have the services. And we hear so often, you know, there's all these services out there. There's all these resources out there. And then you, in the same sentence you'll hear, but I never see that. I don't know where to go. So now we know it's 211. Yep. Um, and so we're going to, we're going to help we're going to ask our, our members and our listeners to help spread the word, um, utilize it, call it, um, do all of that because um, they do have new funding, but funding is always tied to usage. So we need to make sure that we keep this resource um, local for us. So anything else? I think just touching on the road trip, I think what would be so exciting about the road trip is not only getting the word out about 201, but making it better for those rural, small southeast counties that we don't often get to go to all the time. Because our resource database, our machine uh, that we pull resources out of is only as good as what we put in it. So there are some... Um, some of these rural southeast counties that um, they have like informal support systems, you know, go to this church and they'll give you this and they'll give you that. Right. And so just getting, um, I think my foot in the door with those folks um, and being able to know what actually goes on and what resources we can more um, publicize better for, for those communities and, and put into our database database to make it better. Because that's one of the biggest complaints we mm. get from some of those rural um, southeast callers. Well, I call 211, but then there's never anything available. And it's sometimes because it's such an informal support system out there, it'd be nice to have those and get their consent, those folks that run those programs, their right. consent to get that in the database so it benefits the you know greater good. Oh, ab absolutely. So if you're interested in having Yvonne come and talk to your group or learning more, um, let us know and we'll put you on the road trip for her at show at action22.org. All right, we're back. Okay. Yvonne is so great. What a great find. And she's yeah. going to be so perfect for our board. Yep. She's just got that sweet servant leadership spirit about her and her resume is super impressive. We were really excited to have her. So... I want to talk about a couple things, um, but before I get into that, you've been doing a ton of um, work on the veteran side. Will you give us all an update on where everything's at and what what's next? Yeah, so if you read the Colorado Rural Paper, I think that's what it's called. So I, I was uh, quoted in it, and what I said did not come true, and to everybody's surprise. So what what basically what's happening? Um, the VA released a report. It was a result of the Mission Act. So when the Mission Act was signed into law, the VA has to go back and basically do a data analysis of all their clinics. Like, how are they serving the, the veteran population, um, the infrastructure? So are the clinics old, falling apart? Are they new? Take all this in consideration and basically realign funding. So what they do is they say, okay, so these clinics are underutilized or kind of old, aging. We're going to close them down, go to community-based care in that area, while we're going to give more money to these areas where the, the clinics are, like, slammed, basically, and need expansion, uh, more resources, et cetera, et cetera. So what's wrong with that? 
So nothing really. Um, the, what, what's wrong with it is that this is coming from a DC level. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're doing this on numbers. So this is like a corporate decision, for lack of a better term. So they, they don't understand the areas that it's impacting. And, and in this um, report, uh, there's three clinics in the Action 22 footprint that are going to be closed. One is La Junta, Lamar, and Salida. So, and I've mentioned it on the show before. So, of course, Director Kilmore, he is the director of the Eastern Colorado Health System of the VA. So, that's basically the front range of all the VA clinics and hospitals. Uh, He started to get out ahead of this. He knew the report was coming. He booked town halls. He went to every county that this impacts and kind of let the cat out of the bag. And during that time, you know, I said, this is going to go on the public registrar, um, the federal register. And you should be able to comment on it because some of these areas, you know, they don't want their clinic to go away. And in the VA's mind, they could just go to community-based care, which means a health care provider in the community uh, signs on with the VA. So the veteran can go to a private provider um, or private clinic, and then the VA reimburses the clinic for seeing the veteran. Well, there's some issues with that in that the VA is notorious for gumming up the paperwork. Um, also like taking forever to pay these clinics. Mm-hmm. Now this was about five years ago that they started to run into this problem. It is better now. And when Kilmer does these, he literally has the guy on a zoom call or with him that says like, you guys haven't been paid since then. Well, let me fix that. He's so great. Can we just yeah. give a shout out to what a great job he's doing yeah, as a director? He's, he's, he's doing good. Super impressed he, with him. And I've known him forever. He came over from Grand Junction. He, he took over that hospital there and kind of turned it around. So he's done good work. Um, but so they put this report and it's recommendations at this time. So this isn't even approved yet. They put it up. So they have a year federally to look at these recommendations. That's what they call it. And that's where they're closing clinics. They, in the recommendations, they are closing down the CLC, which is the community living center. Um, it's basically a nursing home for veterans and they're closing that down in Pueblo and they're combining it with Springs. And part of that is like just the, the building's bad, right. like, you know, blah, 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 whatever. So the rumor got out that they're closing the Pueblo Clinic, which is not true. And I believe one of the news stations reported that they are closing the, the Pueblo Clinic and they corrected that. It caused a little panic. Yeah. But, but it's not true. But again, um, the clinics that are closing around Pueblo, Pueblo's already slammed. So you're going to see mm-hmm. an influx of these veterans coming from La Junta, you know, Lamar, Salida to Pueblo. So that could overwhelm it. So that's where there's a concern there. Um, On the side note, they are building, hopefully it was in the recommendation to build a clinic in Fremont County. Right. um, With two, at least two teams of primary care providers. Um, So director Kilmer is going through the normal steps because the numbers make sense. So regardless if these recommendations pass, he's already putting in the paperwork to make this happen. And, And of course, we're all advocating for that. That's where we can help, uh, right, you know, our elected officials and say, like, we need a, a clinic here. But in the meantime, for these recommendations, uh, they, they form what's the air, what's called the Air Commission. And the Air Commission is a bipartisan group of, I believe, senators that sit on this, and they approve, they go through this these recommendations, and then the president will sign off on it in a year, about a year they've been saying, I think it's like March or April of next year. And then, um, then it goes to the Senate and the Senate has to approve it and it's thumbs up or thumbs down. Now they said that these recommendations are set in stone, but I believe that the air commission can change or adjust some of this. So what I've been telling the veterans, it's like you have to go to your federal delegation and tell them what you like or don't like about this. And then they can talk to their commission once that's appointed in the Senate. Uh, since it's something that they either have to approve thumbs up, thumbs down. <laughs> One thing that I kind of joked about, it's like, when was the last time you saw <laughs> Congress like Do a thumbs overwhelmingly up, thumbs like agree with something and there's going to be, and it's going into an election year for a lot of these people. So you're going to see like, or the beginning of an election cycle, um, including a presidential election cycle. Uh, you're going to see a lot of people say, well, I'm not going to close a VA clinic in my area. So you'll, you'll see that. But regardless of what happens, I know that Director Kilmer is like, 
going full steam ahead, just acting like these clinics aren't going to close. He's going to do everything he can to bring these providers in because there is a provider shortage too in the rural areas with not just the VA, but with everything medical. Um, the VA actually in the Eastern Colorado healthcare system here on the front range, they did get a, a approval for a, a wage increase for doctors, um, you know, nurses, healthcare providers, uh, counselors, et cetera, like anybody. So the VA is basically throwing its federal weight of recruitment to try to bring providers into Colorado and the rural areas. So that that's a positive. So hopefully we'll see some more staffing in these clinics because they're already way understaffed right now. So you mentioned that they need to let um, let people know who needs to let who know and how do they do that? For the Air Commission? To say what it is that they want for, yeah. So, so that you go to your... You know, you could go to either the House or the Senate side, but you need to call your Senate offices, um, Senator Hickenlooper, Senator Bennett, and say, you know, we do not want this closed. And th- this is for the the La Junta people, the Lamar people, the Salida people. They're the ones that you need to interact with. And to be fair, they are at all of these meetings. They like, are. I was just going to say, they they're way, very they're dialed in on this. Yeah. Um, and so when you tell them, uh, this is what we want or this is what we don't want to have happen, um, or if you bring them solutions, it makes it so much more powerful when um, they're able to take that back. So the senators need to hear from you in order to um, represent and um, support you on this. So yeah. um, if you just reach out to them, and you can find um, how to reach out to them on their on their website, yep. or if you, if you want to get... Um, uh, so if you just look it up, you can find out how to, if you want to know for, so for our area, it's, um, for the action 22 footprint, it's on Bennett's team. It's, um, Renee in the Pueblo office and Aaron Minks in the San Luis Valley. Yep. Um, and then it's, uh, Carrie Linker for, um, Hickenlooper's office and, and Antonio Huerta. And if you've been to any action 22 event or you've been a part of anything, you've already met them because they show up for everything. Yeah. And, and um, the last meeting I went to in Lahana, you know, Renee was asking some very good questions and they are going to get her the answers. And so is Carrie. Like, yeah, they both Carrie's, had very yeah, both good questions them. on it. And, um, you know, we could provide a resource too. There's certain things that the Senate office staffers can't say and also the VA can't say. And that's kind of where I come into these and, right. and lay it out. Um, one other important thing to note about this, again, these are recommendations um, at this point. If they do get approved and signed into law, we won't see these changes until around 2026, 2027. So it's not immediate. They're not shutting it down now. There is some time to either streamline, if they do close these down, the community care programs and kind of meet. And Kilmer has been meeting with a lot of the healthcare providers in the area saying, hey, if this happens, we need to find a solution. And they're on board with them. And and he also has some very good ideas about you know, possibly co-hiring a medical provider with a local clinic, not a VA clinic, but like say a local hospital where the provider comes in and the VA pays their salary for a day a week. And then, you know, the hospital pays the rest of it. Right. So they work four days for the hospital and one day for the VA. There's um, some really interesting yeah. solutions or possible ideas that have come out of this that I don't think anybody independently would have just come up with on their own. Yeah. Um, and director Kellner has done a really, really good job of trying to, um, give it, give space for those, uh, solutions to sort of, um, develop. Um, he's, yeah. he's, I, you said, you told me when you told me about him initially, you said that I was just going to love him and you were right. I've been yeah. super impressed with him. Well, and, and where I messed up in this whole thing, I said, you know, once this goes on the federal register, uh, you could click on it and oh, yeah. give public comment, but that is disabled on it. So you can't actually submit public comment. Now they have said, and this is still unconfirmed, they said that they will be uh, having public comment sessions in person in all the areas that it impacts. And one thing they said there needs, there will be required to address it with a locally elected individual and somebody from a federal elected office. So I, I mean, that's a lot of like counties and stuff. They got a hit in a short amount of time. I don't know if that's going to come true, but they, they do claim um, from the federal VA that they will be having in-person public comment education sessions. 
we'll see if that happens or not. And of, of course, the second that you can give public comment on this, like we'll blast it out there. Right. So the public registry that's not open, that's another um, reason that we, you really need to get your comments into either Senator Bennett's yes. office or um, Senator Hickenlooper's office. If you have yeah. any trouble with that, let us know. We're going to help you yeah. um, that. And you, all you have to do is do show at action22.org and we'll help you with that. So anything else on that? No, um, I, director Kilmer will be coming through every area quarterly. He's already on a second round. He's going to have a, a session here in Pueblo where I think he's going to stay for half a day or all day. There was kind of a scheduling snafu last week with it, but he is coming back to Pueblo. And of course he'll return to all these other communities too on his next road trip for it. He's okay. doing like four a year to everywhere, every County. Okay. So, um, it's an election year. It's midterm elections. Um, <laughs> this is um, pre-game. I don't know. The uh, preview of coming attractions, as my dad used to say. Uh, so I was asked to moderate the uh, the forum for the League of Women Voters for CD3. Um, and it's a primary forum. So that means there's four there's going to be five of them and we'll send out um i'm getting ready to send out the all the con- information on that now this one's going to be um this is going to be zoom there's a couple of them that have already happened but this one's going to be zoom and the reason it's going to be zoom is that was the only way we could get um all of the candidates um to show up for this because it's uh it's both sides um, League of Women Voters does a good job of that side of it. Um, and there's five of them. Um, but it kind of got us thinking. So we had a we had internally just our team, the Action 22 team. Um, last week we um, had a sort of a assessment, a self-assessment of, you know, what we were doing, what we were trying to do. And we started to write down the characteristics that we look for in effective leaders. Because during an election year, you have so many people come to you and ask you questions. And I know I do as well. I get a lot of questions on how should you vote or how do you know who to vote for? Um, And I really am uncomfortable with that question because I don't want to tell somebody how or why or what to vote. I want you guys to, I want people to think it out and really do their, their research. Um, and, um, you know, there's a, their vote, you know, some people feel like their vote doesn't count. I was having a conversation with, uh, um, our good friend Reese, uh, Reeves Brown, He's from the Western Slope, and I was having, a, and I had a little bit of an existential crisis after I talked to him today because we were talking about um, my dad would always say, however I felt at the end of after an election, um, he would always say, "Well, we got it, you know, we got exactly what we deserved." So whoever votes, that's the way free elections go. You get who you deserve. Um, and I'd always, I just hated that. I hated when he said that because I knew he was right. And I think, ah, some, some people I was excited about, some people I'm not. Um, and Reeves, uh, you know, he said, you know, that really is, you know, if you don't like, um, if you don't like who was elected, you don't, you don't have anybody to blame but yourself because in a representative government, you know, you're going to represent that's who they are. That's who gets voted for. Cause we even talked about, you know, things that, that are closer to our heart, elections that are closer to our heart that everybody knows about. We're not going to say name, name names on this. So then I said something to Micah about it and he's like, he goes, man, what kind of self-loathing is that? Some of these people that we voted into office. And I got to thinking about that. And then I thought back to this list that the three of us put together about the characteristics that we're looking in as effective leaders. And I'll tell you why we put this list together in a second. Um, we're Because we're getting ready to put it together an academy. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. But um, the things that we listed, we talked a lot about being um, a collaborative um, people that show up, that they're um, that they understand that policy equals thriving together, that they recognize the positive, that they know how to connect urban and rural, that they're accountable to those that they represent, um, and that representing the policy, um, they understand that the policy, um, how and when and who it will affect, um, integrity first. I can't think of integrity without thinking of Tony Haas in my head. Um, 
adaptability to benefit the whole. They're focused, they're service oriented, they thrive on excellence. Those were the things that you listed. Um, and they're open for discussion that they, that they actually utilize the scientific theory in their, um, in their decision-making process and that they are encouraging of discussion. That's and a, humility. Oh. I think the biggest, I was thinking about that. The biggest thing that makes me mad is when the people right now do not have the ability or the humility to admit when they're wrong and own it. And you're seeing that so much with politicians now that they double down when they know they're wrong about something and not just politicians. This is like everybody yeah, everybody. In general right now. And I think when you run for office and you're elected to office, you need to realize how you need to have that sense of humility in what you do and be able to admit you're wrong. And also, you know, the, the one that another thing that kind of makes me mad, especially recently, it's like, you know, people change their minds. They, they go into something with one idea and then they see everything. They crunch the data for lack of a better term, and they do change their minds. And it seems like that you're not allowed to change your mind on stuff anymore. So it's not an evolution in thinking. It's a flip flop, um, which is completely. And when you said humility, I thought of something completely different. We see a lot of, um, we see leaders taking credit Mm -hmm. for something that they actually had no control over, or they, they say, if they say something, then they're taking credit for a policy change that didn't happen or just taking credit where they don't really shouldn't be taking credit. Um, for instead of instead of acknowledging who other people so you thought that on humility and I thought a completely different thing so I think you're right on um, yeah humility would be a really great thing uh, and I think about really effective leadership um, you know I think about people who I look up to and there weren't a whole lot of um, state or you know federally elected uh, my list is short of of leaders that I look up to and I don't think I have a really high bar I tend to put people on a pedestal but if they show even half of these characteristics they are ones to really admire like integrity I think Tony Haas he's an elected official I I haven't voted for him but um, he's a county commissioner Um, and I think you see that's the other thing I think you see these characteristics come out more on and maybe this is just me on the local elected mm-hmm. officials than you see on others well, you know, on fire the, up. It's the local elected officials yeah, that I have the highest respect the, for. That's because local elected officials, um, they do have that accountability. You know, they, they go to the same grocery store that you right. go to. They go to the same events. Their kids go to soccer. So there is more accountability, you know, in, specifically in person with local elected officials. Federal, you know, you're covering a large, a large area or you're in D.C. like three quarters of the time and back. You really don't get that interaction with the people you represent. But if you're a county commissioner in, say, Bank County, um, you are going to see all of your constituents at least once a week, probably. No, you are. And then you usually, I think more often than not, you do have some kind of a personal relationship with them. They're not more than um, two degrees be, that separate you and yeah. whoever that is, which does um, that it does make them. Um, well, and, and the, ch- the choices you make and how you govern on a local level impacts not only you, but your neighbors and your friends and your family. So, and it impacts it faster. You know, the, the, want to see stuff get done immediately run for county commissioner because the things that you do you will see the results immediately right well and i think on the local level um the way that the other thing that that provides is you're setting them up for success a little bit better you know we talk about when we when we um vote somebody into office regardless of where what level of of government that they're on um we're we're hiring them to do a job and are we setting them up for success or are we not? And that was, I think that was the kind of the point that Reeves Brown was trying to make to me today was, you know, are we really, um, are we really setting them up for success or are we, um, do we sort of abandon them to the wolves as soon as they get into office? And it goes back to that, that we don't, we don't allow for evolution. We don't allow for development. We don't allow for correcting um, an antiquated thought process all we want to do is is keep the fight going. Um, so, uh, 
This will be interesting. I'm excited. I was really honored to be asked to moderate this um, particular forum. Um, but as we go through the summer, I think the conversations that we're going to be having a lot more of is how do we set up um, those people, especially on the local government, but also on the state side too, for more success. So here's what, here's our big, hairy, audacious goal um, between now and and the annual meeting. Um, this was your idea. This was sort of your brainchild and we're developing it because um, we are still fa- trying to find somebody that's going to tell us this is a really bad idea. Don't do it. Um, is a an Action 22 Policy Governance and Leadership Academy. Yes. So talk a little bit about why initially you're like, this is something that we should do. Um, because there's a lot of these out there and I think there's some really good ones out there, but they're not all encompassing. And I thought that if we could put something together that is kind of like the whole shebang, uh, you know, you have like leadership Pueblo, leadership of the Rockies, you have they're the great. Farm Bureau. They're great, but you know, some of these that I've been through are like four days, right? You go somewhere for four days or you go somewhere for a week. So I was thinking to, uh, extend it over for or like six months. I, I still think, and we're playing with this like a year long one, mm-hmm. but work with the colleges, um, uh, both community colleges and higher ed, um, like CU colleges like this, but really structure the class on you start at the beginning, you get a full understanding of how, and we'll just say state, uh, yeah. right now, state government works from the fiscal policy to how bills are written, how to support, uh, influence, you know, these, these legislators, uh, if it's something good, you know, or bad or whatever, but really start with this, this hard compact education on, okay, this is how it works. And then from there kind of split it up and say, by the end of this class or this academy, um, you will have either drafted a bill that was introduced while working with your legislators. Um, you will take a position on legislation, mm-hmm. either opposed or for it in support of it. And with that, you will testify on the legislation supporting it or opposing it and why. And then really delve into that and then get an understanding how the state government really works. So it's going to be like boots on the ground. So right. we're not just meeting on zoom once a month. It's like, okay, we're going to Denver. We're going to talk to the lobbyists. We're going to talk to the legislature. You're going to sit here and see how it's done. And then the next one, you're going to come here and sit in front of a committee and testify on this. Um, you're going to work with this legislator to draft legislation that will be introduced for your area of interest, whether it's, uh, agriculture, energy, education, whatever. And then when you, when you finish it, you really walk out with this six months of fully understanding how the legislative process works in Colorado. Now with that as well, there is a leadership component to it as well. So that's like interacting with local leaders, how to navigate your local systems, how to navigate the federal system, um, how does the federal system work versus the state system? What is a lobbyist? What is a nonprofit? What is an advocacy group? You will understand it, and then you will have the tools to, if you work in that area, to be a leader, to really lead your group or organization into effectively changing these laws and policies that are impacting your area, I guess, for lack of a better term. No, that's. I think that's exactly what we're trying to drive at. Um, uh, somebody characterized it, um, Garrison Ortiz, who's our county commissioner, characterized it as building a deeper bench. You know, a lot of the programs, leadership programs are out, that are out there that are really, really, and they're really, really good. Uh, and we recommend that you participate in them. If they're about your personal leadership, how to develop your leadership personally for yourself and then those around you. This is a, this is going to be a more technical, um, very much how you do this, how you build those collaborations. So much of the funding is tied to those collaborations, those public private partnerships. Uh, and how do you, how do you create a collaboration when, um, you need to have a a solar project, for example, which we've seen recently, um, that they, there needed to be some zoning updates or some ordinances that were updated. Um, and then the ordinances that are like right on a county, um, county line and they go over a county line. We know of, um, energy development where, um, it's, how do you, how do you bring a region together to create, um, at least complementary on some of these things so that, um, the growth and the development that can and will happen 
on a local level is being governed by local instead of um, somebody else coming in and saying this is how it's done. And on and the issues, the big issues that affect all Coloradans, um, the ones that we hear about all the time, um, energy, environment, water, education, um, agriculture, uh rural economic development, all the stuff that we focus on constantly, that's going to be the very technical piece of how to make that happen. Um, and so we don't, we don't know exactly what it's going to look like. Um, and it's, that's the part that it's going to be by the members and for the members. Our members are going to tell us what matters most to them as far as they're developing their specific skills. Um, and that's what we're going to focus on, but it's going to have that overarching. How do you navigate that? How yeah. do you do that? Basically it's the stuff that action 22 that our team does all the time that we take for granted. Yeah. Um, and so we want, we want to pay it forward. We want to develop that throughout the region. Um, we know that the funding is, you know, the funding is going to be an issue, how to do this. But it's, I don't think it's going to be that big of an issue. I think this, with so far, everybody that we've visited with about this has been so receptive. Everybody's excited about it. We're just trying to figure out how to focus it on something that's good for everybody because everybody right. we talk to has a different idea about where it should go. But we're working on that. That's part of putting together a steering committee and, yeah. and, and do this. And it will only grow after this. If we're successful with the first one, then it's going to get bigger. And, and, it's gonna and get then bigger. that offers us more opportunity to grow it in certain areas. I think that one thing that you'll walk out, it's going to be an intensive and there is going to be homework. But after you go through this, you're going to know more about everything that you could bring back again to your team, wherever you're from, and just use that and that information will spread. Um, it, it's, although we say leadership, I would assume that anybody that goes through this, the majority of them will already be strong leaders in yeah. where they're coming from. There might be... Um, you know, some, some, I'll say younger people that go through it f for reasons, but I, I would like to see that, you know, strong leaders are going through this, that they can bring it back, uh, to their organization and, and just use that information and also walk out of it with doing something impactful. That's the one thing you go through these classes. They're great. You get a certificate, like you'll be able to walk out of this class saying like, look at, I was a part of this. It changed this for the better. Right. And I made an impact that helps Colorado, uh, my organization, my family, my town, whatever, by the end of this, you will walk away may, knowing that you made an impact in something in Colorado. If we all we do is teach people about Colorado fiscal policy, I'll be happy. That's one of the things that makes me just sad. Uh, any conversation, any board I sit on, any um, discussion that I have, it all comes back to Colorado fiscal policy and there's such a lack of understanding on it. Yeah. Um, but it will, you're right. It will be, it will be something actionable that you can do right away. So it's going to be project based too. The fiscal policy thing is frustrating because you can run ballot measures here and nobody ever like figures out how to pay for these. So you'll have something <laughs> introduced through the petition process that'll go on the ballot and the people that do this do not understand how Colorado budgeting works. And that I think that'll be important that we'll show that. Right. To these. The same thing with legislation. Like, well, we really want, we want to write this to help these, you know, this group or these people or whatever. It's like, great. How are you going to pay for that? You can't just borrow the money in Colorado. It has to come from somewhere. You can't. Growth has to, growth has to pay for itself in Colorado. That's one of the things. Um, and uh, you can't. Uh, um, raise taxes on Coloradans without Coloradans permission. Yep. So those are, that's Colorado fiscal policy in a nutshell, but it gets way more complicated than that. So, um, but we're going to do some fun stuff this summer too. We're going to have on June 24th and details to follow. Um, we're going to have an, we'll have our action 22 mid-year board, um, board meeting. But then after that, we're going to do a membership, um, appreciation recognition event. Um, so mark your calendars for that for Action 22 members. We want you um, to be here for that. It's going to be a, a fun, very Action 22, just enjoying each other's company kind of event. Um, we are going to you know do some recognition. And then if you've been to an Action 22 um, event before, you know that there will be some surprises on that part of it. Yep. It'll be a fun party. It'll <laughs> be a fun party. party on the 24th. June 24th, it's a Friday. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. So, um, we'll have more to follow. Well, We'll have more to follow on that. Um, if you're not a member of Action 22, you need to get a hold of us. Um, you can re- reach us at show at action22.org. Um, you should be getting something in um, the on the email list. If you're not, if you don't currently get Action 22 email blasts, um, email us at show at action22.org and we'll put you on our mailing list. Um, and Micah will be reaching back out to you in order to get you um, signed up as a member. Um, and with everything that we do, we don't endorse. We do we, not endorse nor support political candidates. We don't. We are passionately nonpartisan, but we do very much support Action 22 members. And if you are a, a candidate for office from dog catcher up to president and you're an Action 22 member, this is an open platform for you. We encourage and ask that all people running for office that are Action 22 members come on our show and tell us what you're about. Yes. Uh, with that, you can go to action22.org, to the, our website, and there's information on becoming a member there and, and all the fun links. And again, any questions, comments, concerns, email us at show, S-H-O-W, at Action 22. That's A C T I O N two two the numbers dot org <laughs> org show at action 22.org and chad forthman i know you're listening um i'm gonna see you in the next day or two but you know that bet that we've got going i think i've got it in the bag now we'll see you next week bye